Hello and welcome to a live Kerfeffy break on the program with Carrie Smith. I am your host, Carrie. Uh, I hope you're having a beautiful Monday already. Uh, I'm I I wanna I'm gonna tell you up front. I couldn't sleep well the past two nights. <laughs> so I'm a little bit out of it. I'm highly caffeinated though, so we should be good. Uh, two nights ago, there was a bad storm and my husband was also on the road. And so Tiger and I, Tiger was really freaked out because when it storms here, it sounds like it's right in the room with you. It's crazy. It's, there's a high incidence of tornadoes here. I think there was a tornado warning anyway. And, uh, and then Tiger, my dog got me a little freaked out. So, and then last night I don't, I don't know why. Maybe my body was just couldn't couldn't go to sleep because of the night before. I don't know. Anyway, I'm here. <laughs> I'm having a good uh I'm having a good Monday, all things considered. Oh, hey, hey, Chris Williams. Okay, Dove True is here. Kara, you're famous to me. <laughs> How funny. I thought today's title was a funny title. Thank God you're not famous. And uh, I do thank God I'm not famous, and I think we should all thank God we're not famous. And the reason I wanted to talk about this, it's funny, sometimes a, a topic for a show will come from conversations I'm having with my husband or a friend or something I hear in church or a combination of the two or or things I've seen online. And so this is one of those topics. It's something that I've talked about with people before. I had a, it's, it's, I had a conversation about it this past week, uh, with some, some women, some friends. And then I watched a uh, part of a clip that, that my husband was talking about with ice cube and Bill Maher, and they were talking about fame. And so that was on my mind. And then in church yesterday at the church on the square in Georgetown, Texas, if you want to check out some sermons in church yesterday, our pastor Bradley Helgerson he was saying something at one point, he, he gave a shocking statistic, or he mentioned the the fact that a very large number of younger people in surveys and studies say that they aspire to fame. Now, I'm not shocked that people aspire to fame. I used to work in entertainment, and I worked around people who, some of whom were chasing fame. Some some were chasing, I think, legitimately, you know, getting their art out to wider audience, um, making connections with people through art, through comedy, through music. Um, but even people with the best in, of intentions, all of us, our original intentions can become perverted, I think, when you start to acquire a bit of notoriety or fame. And so I heard this statistic about young people, and I looked this up, and this is an article from 2017, so this is a little dated now. I'm sure the numbers are even higher. I looked at a couple of studies, but this was probably the best summary I saw. And it says, this is a headline from The Independent, millennials will go to extreme lengths for celebrity fame, including disowning their family, <laughs> disowning their family find social media report. And then the subtitle of this is doctor, lawyer, or YouTube star. And so if you scroll down, it says, I'll just read just a little bit of this. Fame seeking is nothing new, but according to a recent study, millennials are willing to go to extreme lengths to become a celebrity. If you were to ask a millennial, someone born between the mid eighties and mid nineties, which career choice they would prefer out of, let's say, a doctor, lawyer, or YouTube star, chances are they're more likely to want to peddle teeth whitening on Instagram than become a cardiologist. Really? <laughs> okay. But as a, a teeth whitening on Instagram? But as a generation raised on reality TV and YouTube stars, is this really that surprising? Perhaps not. But a report published uh, by social media network Clap It!, did reveal some shocking statistics on what youngsters are prepared to give up in order to become a household name. While the knowledge that more than a quarter of millennials would quit their day jobs doesn't come as too much of a, uh, too much of a surprise, the fact that one, of, one out of 12 would disown their family is disturbing. 
this sounds like one of those would you rather games you know would you do or what what's your price tag games and i'm shocked i am shocked by what people would be willing to do to attain some of these things to attain fame to attain money Similarly, the research also found that one out of 10 millennials would sacrifice their education for fame, while one in nine would give up marriage and the prospect of having children. Quote, there's no doubt that social media is making fame more desirable than ever before for today's generation. Uh, Mary Jane Belesco, co-founder of Clapit, said in the report, Social media platforms have democratized the talent discovery process, that's true, allowing for people of all ages and talents to share their work with the world. No longer do celebrities solely live on stages and movie screens, but they are born in their homes and are accessible to us in ours. So, yes, one in 12 would disown a family member if it meant they could become famous. So... I was thinking about this. I was thinking about the YouTube uh, video I saw, the clip with uh, Ice Cube and Bill Maher. We're going to watch a little bit of that as well. And I don't know if this is something that comes with age or or changing of ideology, which happened to me, or become a Christian. I'm not exactly sure what it is. But it seems obvious to me when I look around the world and when I've tried to understand the world, both both the, our modern world with social media influence and stuff or um, history, that the three most corrupting influences seem to be money, fame, power. And I think those are all related. They can be related. Money and fame can lead to power. And as we've all heard, you know, power is absolutely corrupting. But I guess there's a lot of young people who aren't thinking about these things. I think in this culture, you're just sort of, you're sort of raised with the idea. Well, a lot of things up is down and down is up. And so the things that are celebrated, the thing that things that the world sort of hold uh, dear and put value in end up being the things that mean the very least. And, and so I think, I think that's part of what's happening, but I also think can't you look around and see the results of fame and how it's affected people? Look at, look at child stars, for example, look at how many, because, because that's when fame hits someone who's not even developed yet, who, you know, still has, has a developing brain. They don't even know who they are as adults yet. And they get hit with fame and look at all the rates of drug addiction, suicide, depression, broken relationships, it, you see that over and over again. And it's not just the child stars. Some of the most famous people in the world think of Madonna, for example. Madonna is someone, she's in, you know, I'm going to be talking about people in the public eye. Obviously, this is an episode about fame. Um, and to clarify what I mean by fame, someone was joking around on, on uh, Facebook and they were like, they were kind of like, hey, Dub True, like, oh, I think you're famous. It's like, no, come on. The fame, I mean, I mean commonly known by by the population. So for example, Kamala Harris is someone who is famous now. Uh, but prior to 2017, she wasn't. Even though she was known in certain places and I guess, you know, famous in California or what have you, she wasn't, it's not that level of the public knowing who you are. So the people I'm talking about are commonly known by the public. And Madonna, I think, is one of the saddest illustrations of the dangers of fame, in my opinion, the trappings of fame, money, and power. Um, because if you look at what's happened to her, I don't think anyone can objectively, if they're honest, look at her Instagram feed, for example, and think that she is mentally well or that she has her values in a healthy place or that her self-image is 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 based on healthy 
uh, characteristics and traits and and values. Like I, I don't I don't think you can look at that and honestly say, yeah, she seems like she's doing okay. <laughs> like like I'm not saying this to pick on her. I'm saying, you know, there before the grace of God go we. Like she is a big flashing red light. This is what can happen. And there are many of those. She's not the only one. She's just the first one that comes to mind. Um The other thing my my pastor was saying yesterday that somewhat relates to the fame topic was he was talking about when you're given an amount of responsibility, whether that is uh, fame, power, influence, money, a family, like a spouse, kids, what do you do with that responsibility? How do you steward it? How do you use it? Do you? do you use it or does it use you kind of, that's what I was thinking. Does it use you? And I think for a lot of people, most people, maybe it's not normal to have that level of, uh, of celebrity and fame. It's not normal. That's not the normal human condition where you can't go out into the world as a normal person and interact as a normal person. I, like I said, I worked in entertainment and I worked around some famous people occasionally. And there was one in particular who <laughs> I'll, I'll just say his name. Who cares? <laughs> Chris Rock. He was a, he was an executive producer on a show I was on. And I remember him talking to the comedian who was the host of the show, who was one of my clients who was unknown, relatively unknown when we started the show and he was sort of saying to him and a few of the other comedians who worked there, you know, you're going to become a monster too. You're going to become a monster like me. And at the time we were all thinking, no, nobody, because he was pretty monstrous. The thing I liked about him though, was at least he knew it. <laughs> he was aware of it, but yes, he was a bit of a monster. He had a habit of screaming at people. He always seemed to be angry. Um, there was just something going on there. And, but he was saying, you'll become a monster like me. And I remember being, you know, at that time, now I look back and, and think, oh, how naive we were. Because I remember the comic I worked with and and one of the other comedians and myself, and we we're all like, no, you know, he's not going to become this way. And I watched it happen. Um, a lot of times when these people acquire fame, they start to keep just the yes people around them. I mean, one of, one of the people I worked with, he, he put, he said it like this. He was like, it's, it goes to your head being able to have like a personal assistant, for example, or several personal assistants, having someone at your beck and call who you can send out to get whatever you want at any time of day. And it go, he was saying, it goes to your head, that level of adoration. Take Chris Rock, for example. As I just said, he was pretty monstrous on set. Everyone, a lot of people hated him. But at the same time, they worshipped him because he was Chris Rock. So it was this weird kind of ass kissing, but also he's horrible and we hope he doesn't come into the office today. But also if he's here, I want to get noticed by him in the writing room. You know, like it was this weird a unnatural way that people treated him and that people treat famous people. And I just don't think humans are meant to live like that. And it's very few humans who can, who can manage it or, or who t appear to be able to manage it. And I did meet a few who I think managed it well. Um, you know, I didn't know him well, but I interacted with him a few times. Dave Chappelle was someone who, seem to manage it well. And I watched just like everyone else, um, you know, years prior, I was one of the people watching when he walked away from his very popular, very lucrative television show. And the media couldn't believe it. They said he was crazy because he was walking away from millions of dollars. And I look back on that now and I think, oh, he was trying to ground himself. He was grounded. He was someone who was trying to manage it. That was probably the sanest thing he ever did was leave that show. 
at the height of his fame with all that money. And so I think it's it's the rare human who can end up figuring out how to manage it well. And I think this is why it's this is why if you become famous when you're a child, you you almost don't stand a chance <laughs> because you haven't developed yet. You don't know what you believe. A lot of times you don't you don't have a system of belief yet. And with adults, the ones who've managed to do it, I think a lot of times you you find they do have a belief in something greater than themselves. Um, and I'll say with the caveat, that doesn't even protect you being a believer. The other thing that was on my mind before we watched some of these clips, I just watched, if you haven't seen it, I just watched a, a series on HBO called The Way Down. I watch a lot of cult documentaries and and docu series because I they help me better understand psychopathy, narcissism. Um, they help me understand the social justice cult I was in. They help me understand human nature, the dark side of human nature. And this documentary, it's called The Way Down, and, and it's about Gwen Shamblin, who I wasn't even familiar with before this, but she was a very famous mega pastor and best-selling Christian author um, of the a church that's called the Remnant Fellowship in Tennessee. And she built this empire with these books, uh, called, I think books and a program called The Way Down, which was a diet program and a diet book that was rooted in the Christian belief system and Christianity. And after she saw this success with the book, she went on to found this church in 1999 in Tennessee called the Remnant Fellowship. And from there, it just went bigger and bigger. And I think what you, what I saw in this documentary was that whatever belief, sincere belief she may have had at the beginning, and I do think she had sincere belief, um, became perverted and corrupted by the level of fame, money, and power that she was acquiring. And at the end of this story, she's, in my opinion, pretty unrecognizable from who she was at the beginning. Um, and whatever her original intentions and goals were for helping people to better themselves, to become healthier, to lose weight, to find God... I think those all got overshadowed by the trappings of fame, money, power. I would highly recommend this documentary series. Um, there's five episodes. It's fascinating. I might even do an episode specifically on that series later. Um, but I also watched, I watched another docuseries about another religious cult. Now, it wasn't a Christian cult. It's called Love Has Won. That was the name of the cult and the name of the, the docuseries. I think this one was only three episodes, maybe. And this was about this woman, Amy Carlson, who was sort of into this new age spirituality mumbo jumbo. And she came to believe at some points, it's clear she really did believe. And other points, she acknowledged that she didn't believe and maybe she had made it all up, but she came to believe that she was God, that she was mother God is what she called herself. And she amassed a cult following of people who came to follow her and live, live with her in this cult setting. And that one's also fascinating because though she never attained the mainstream, I would say uh, fame of Gwen Shamblin and the remnant fellowship church, you, she, you can see the the fame in this like microcosm within her cult. She was famous. She was at the top. She was, and she had absolute power and she was God. She said she was God. She also said she was Jesus and the goddess Pele and that Elvis was her son and Trump was her father. She said a lot of crazy things, but these people just, it's fascinating. Cult documentaries are fascinating because you can, you watch the process of how people get pulled into a cult in increments 
and and I think that it's a mistake to look from the outside and say these people are crazy um, or these people are stupid. There's some very intelligent people who get pulled in. It's a, it's a matter of degrees. They're pulled in. You know, it's the it's the whole um, frog in a boiling pot analogy. But anyway. In that documentary, you know, Amy Carlson destroys herself. She destroys herself. And there's these people around her who supposedly love her and literally worship her. They wake up every day with notebooks and they just record everything she, that God, that she does. Like, she burped. Okay, she ate a lollipop. Oh, she's drinking her seventh beer, you know. And she became anorexic. She was alcoholic. All of this, they... They let her do it. They were enablers. You get to watch, you know, they'll enable anything because she's, they worship her. And I think that's an analogy for what happens to people when they become, when they become celebrities, when they become famous, everyone around them becomes an enabler. Even if you can see that they're becoming a monster or that they're destroying themselves in some way, or that they're destroying others, even if you can see that it's destructive, People just tend to kiss ass and enable because they want some something from that famous person. They want to be in, you know, the envelope of fame. They want to be in the cloud of it with them, that access to it, and they enable. And what I saw happen when I worked in entertainment, and I'm sure even if you didn't work in entertainment, you've seen this before, is that um the more if if a person was getting drunk on the fame the attention the money the power the influence what have you um the more that they got drunk on it the more they would surround themselves with the enablers and eventually push away anyone who knew them before or who had their best interests at heart or, you know, was offering them criticism or challenging them or trying to help them. Like they would end up isolating themselves among just the yes men who want something from them, which is funny because a lot of times when a person becomes famous, they, they stop making new friends because they don't know who they can trust because it seems that everyone does want something from them. So it's funny then that they just kind of collect those yes people around them, um, which enables the destruction. It enables the addiction to fame itself or to money itself or to power itself. So we're going to watch some clips because when I heard the statistic about <laughs> young people desiring fame so much that they would they would sacrifice marriage and children and a family member and i'm i'm just where where have you been do you not see what's happened to people so i wanted to listen to some people who are famous who i think have managed to ground themselves or pull them you know maybe they became ungrounded at some point but pull themselves back and find grounding and so i have a couple of clips pulled up we're going to we're going to watch a clip from ice cube uh, Russell Brand and one from Joe Rogan, maybe one more. Um, let's start with the Ice Cube one. Now, this is pretty cool. This was when Ice Cube was on Bill Maher's show. And this was just like seven months ago, but I just saw it for the first time. So maybe you haven't seen it either. Cool shit. Not everybody in show business has their head on straight like that in fact i would no. say <laughs> would you not agree that the rule more is that they don't there's something about people in show business what draws people to show business or the type of people who succeed as my friend jimmy always says and it's the greatest quote he said insanity photographs yeah yeah it does people love to there's some a lot of the people who are become the biggest stars or get the incredible followings there is a kind of insanity in them they're they're very often in their own world especially musicians you know have no idea i don't ask them who the vice president is yeah uh you know they, they get to they get used to people handling them right and they 
they get lazier and everything comes easier and you know pretty soon they're they're just kind of being ragdolled around um well and some of them you know are leading the charge uh you know it, it it's uh it was a a, a, a saying by uh robin i said robin harris you know if I sit in first class, I want everything I'm supposed to get, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, some people are, I'm a rock right. star, God damn it! I'm going to live the rock star life. Well, I'm a the, rap star, I'm going to live the life. And the problem is that the whole world is essentially your enabler. I mean, it's one thing if you have a, a more normal life and you have an enabler, you can go to that one person and say, look, you're not helping this guy at all by doing these things that are enabling him and his, his addictions, yeah. inclu addictions, including to pigging out mm -hmm. on fame and money and, yeah. and the privilege that is afforded to people who everyone else uh, <laughs> idolizes. But you can't, you can say it to one person, you can't say it to a fan base. You can't say it. This, this, is, this is so important. This is exactly what I was talking about with the documentary Love is One, where you can see all of the enablers in, in a microcosm because it's, you know, it's her cult followers who are there with her. I don't know, maybe 30 people. But if you scale that up and you reach the level of fame of someone like Madonna, how do you tell the world to stop enabling this? How do you roll it back? And so the strength that you would have to have as a human being, like the strength that Ice Cube has to have, because he comes off as very grounded to me. The strength that he would have to have to withstand that and to not let it corrupt him, you know, that's a, I think that's rare. And I think, I think humans tend to be, we're so arrogant. It's like, oh, if it were me, I could do it. <laughs> it's like with uh it's like with communism like oh co real communism hasn't been tried yet i could do it right you know they're like oh real marxism hasn't been tried i could really implement it i could get it going me right and that and people say, think that about fame too i think where it's like oh well yeah there's all those examples of people who just you let it go to their let it go to their head and it destroyed them and uh but but i could do it <laughs> why do you think that why do you think that and all these people hey you're not doing this guy any favors by remaining his they're going to be his fans nowadays fans are like stands mm -hmm. right yeah they're beyond fans yeah they get literally violent sometimes yeah. <laughs> if you I mean could you imagine going against the beehive Right. No, no like, I, come on now. You want to get stung <laughs> a, a thousand times right. a day, you know? So, uh, yeah, you know, people, you know, they, they, uh, you can create your own little kingdom, you know, in your own little head and, your and they own do little, yes. you know, you know, you know, so it, it happens and, but you have to work for it not to happen you know you, you have, have to be conscious that's the that's you the, be conscious. that's the line and i have to work for it not to happen uh this is a great quote i'm not going to pick on you putt jack i just this is a good jumping off point for me to say something i wanted to say earlier and forgot so putt jack in the chat says it's hard enough to be poor and non-famous um yes and I, I think part of the problem is that we all know and we all uh even the way we talk about not having things right like it, it is from a perspective of a lack like there's something missing or it's hard and we all know that it's hard to struggle financially we all know that but society tells us it it's not going to be hard it's not going to be bad if you if 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 you happen to be in the opposite circumstance with a lot of wealth, for example, things are going to be great. And that's just not true. I mean, I've said this before on the show, but I look at children who are born into wealth and fame, extreme wealth and fame, and I just say, thank God. You know, we all have our own circumstances and 
that we were born into and our own struggles and life experiences. And as the social justice people would say, marginalizations and privileges, right? I'm just glad that wasn't one that I had to deal with because I don't know how you find your grounding when you're born into a condition, a situation that's not natural for humans to be in. And that's what you know from birth. So if I, I look at the children of people like Joe Biden, for example, look at Hunter Biden, look at look at Joe Biden's daughter. I mean, look at all the problems and all the struggles that they have. And I, I'm not saying this to say, you know, like, oh, poor Hunter. I'm just, it, it, they remind me of child stars in that they just seem completely lost. And how do you get out of that if you've never known anything different, if you were born into that situation? Yes. You know, I looked in the mirror when I was a teenager still, you know, I had one or two cool songs that was starting to bubble. And I looked in the mirror and I said, I, I don't, I don't, I still want to be myself. You know, I don't, don't lose that guy you looking at in that mirror. And every so often I make sure I take that long look and make sure that I still recognize the guy that's looking back. Well, I love that. I love that he's cognizant of that and that he's he's got this practice for trying to stay in check. I've got another clip for you here. This is Joe Rogan. And he's talking about fame and he's talking about at the beginning specifically uh I believe a child star. That's a, that's magnified when you have children because yeah. they they have no say. Well, that's you the know, other like invulnerability I have. Kids, they put their kids out there. Yeah. And I'm like, well, okay, I don't not. I'm not saying it's the worst thing to do, but it's not the child's choice. <laughs> I just want Judson <laughs> Judson Pinson made me laugh. <laughs> He says, if everyone in the chat would just send me $1,000, I would be humble and charitable. <laughs> you guys crack me up. And they're very young. And you're making a – you're look, like whoever did what they did to Michael Jackson, right? Yeah. One of the things that they did is they made him famous way before he had any Michael idea Jackson. what the fuck that meant. Yeah. And they profited off of it. Yeah. They kind of pimped him out, right? Yeah. And that's kind of what's happening. And they destroyed him. Yeah. Well, ultimately, the whole thing destroyed him, right? And um, I just, I, I don't want to be a part of that. I just, there's no, no benefit I think that's in smart. it. I don't think it's yeah. intelligent. And I also don't, this is my real honest feelings. I do not think that fame is, uh, I don't think that people should aspire to it. I think it should be something that happens if people like your work and then it's cool, it's fine. But I think there's way too much emphasis put on just trying to get attention. And I'm going to pause it here for a second. The, what he's talking about is fame as the end goal itself, which that I believe is always a recipe for disaster. Your your desires are in the wrong place. I mean, then you also have the people who uh, like Gwen Shamblin, for example, that may not have been her goal at the beginning, but over time, her original goal got replaced by fame. But if you're the person who's starting out from the beginning, you, there is no other goal other than just to become famous. That's it, the, the end in and of itself. Like that's always going to be destructive. That's always going to be, there's something wrong. There's something wrong already with you and your priorities. I don't think there are any exceptions to that. I think that's absolutely the case. I think your priorities are messed up. I'm going to stop sharing this just for a second. Um, I've shared this anecdote before. There, there was one comedian I worked with at one point who he he acquired some level of success, but he didn't become famous, and that was what he was always chasing. And it was this weird kind of, unlike a lot of the other artists I worked with, when he talked about the next thing he would want to be working on or the next thing he would want to do, it was never 
coming from this place of a creative spirit that's inside of him that he has to get this out. You know, it wasn't like a, a musician who's like, oh, I've got this record in my head. I can't, you know, I've got to get this out. I've got to make this. It wasn't some creative inspiration. It wasn't driven by creativity. It was always driven in this person's case by a desire for fame. It was incredible. And so I didn't know I, if, if this person had always been this way or if, if his priorities had become corrupted before I met him. But every new endeavor, unlike with the other artists I worked with, every new endeavor was sort of pitched to me from this place of, oh, well, uh, like at that time, um, Mark Maron, there weren't a lot of people doing podcasts yet, but some of the comedians had started doing them. And Mark Maron had a podcast that was very popular. It was the WTF podcast. I don't know. He pro maybe probably still does that. <laughs> um, but it was even before Joe Rogan's podcast. So Mark Maron had that and it was it was very popular. And And I remember him saying, okay, I'm going to do a podcast now. And instead of it coming from a place of, because I want to talk about this and this is what I'm compelled and I have to get this out there, or I want to interview these people and this is what compels me, or I want to talk, you know, instead of it coming from a creative place, it was because I need to get famous and that's what Mark Maron did. And I'm like, whoa, how are you going to, how are you going to sustain that if it's not something you're interested in? And it was similar. It was like, you know, okay, I'm going to do acting now because I need to get famous. Okay, I'm going to do comedy now because I need to get famous. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do, I'm going to try music now because I need to get famous. It was just this weird kind of um, uh, plate spinning and tap dancing. And the problem was that the, the, in the hierarchy of goals, that was the top one. And that's always going to, that's always going to end badly. It's starting badly. <laughs> You know, you should, you should. Sorry, I was listening to the the, the Rogan clip and I'm like, what, can they hear it? And it's because it wasn't on the screen. <laughs> okay, let me back up just a little bit. It should make sense. It should make sense. There should be some reason. And if it's out of balance. Yeah. You know, you should, you should probably look at like, why, why is it out of balance? Like, yeah. And lots of things that attract attention are not things that we need we, we want more of it's, it, you know like it, conflict yes conflict that's a big one but it's also the i like just fame itself one of the weirdest parts about it is that you have to constantly be checking yourself like all these people are nice to you all these people uh are saying nice things to you or being mean to you you know one of the like right. they, all people that you don't even know so right. you you can't rely on them for your self esteem and right. you certainly can't rely on them for criticism you can't rely on them and people you don't even know that don't care about you you know so you you you're in this weird position you have to be very careful with who you communicate with cuz one of the weirdest things you'll see from famous people is all of a sudden they get this very strange thing where they feel like people are supposed to do things for them mm. and mm -hmm. you know, they don't, they're not supposed to pay for things and everything's supposed to be easy and they're supposed to get that. That's a, that's a weird. I saw this, this weird entitlement that happened a few times. I went to a couple of, uh, I went to a couple of film festivals with one of the clients I managed and it, and it was incredible to see, that the celebrities come in, um, I believe it was an H and M. So the film festival, and and the same thing would happen at South by Southwest in Austin. The festival would have all these different like sponsors or brands or stores that wanted to be involved, and that happens at South by as well. And I experienced it there with clients. But but you would go into these booths or you would go into the H and M, and based on your level of fame they would give you more free stuff. <laughs> and so like the most famous person would oh come in like in the Levi's tent, they'd just get like tons of free Levi's or, you know, Bose speakers in the speaker tent. And, and if you weren't as famous, they'd be like, mm, like they'd tell your handler, me, like the manager, someone like, I might be able to give her a pair of jeans, you know, kind of thing. It was so weird. Cause it's like, wow, the ones with the most celebrity and, uh, and money, are getting the most free stuff. 
which makes sense because they have the celebrity and the brand, they have the fame, they have the influence and the brand wants them to wear it. And, but some of the people, they let this weird, again, unnatural world that they're living in go to their head. And like Rogan is saying, I would see some people who just began to expect it. Like they would expect other people to pay for everything, even though they were always the wealthiest person in the room. <laughs> and you're like, this is weird. Like you, uh, it was sort of this, uh, I'm owed this attitude. Not always, but I would see some of them pick that up become like extremely uncharitable and extremely entitled in terms of what they're owed um i remember i'll tell another anecdote just because this is funny uh one of the comics i worked with was margaret cho and i remember at a film festival it was it was the h&m store and she had a small uh indie movie there um and we went in and they had told her she could pick out one outfit <laughs> and so <laughs> she just started in a funny way she's a comedian but she just started needling them like is that what is that what helena bottom carter's getting is she just getting one outfit <laughs> like, i want to get what she's getting and they're like uh it's just you could have one outfit so she was running around the store and just and like you know got a top and pants and then she got underwear and then she got a coat she was like it's all part of one outfit and this belt and a hat and i need some shoes and i need socks it's all one outfit <laughs> and just adding as much on as she could but i just thought that was really funny she's like what is hell in the bottom carter getting <laughs> um anyway yes what he's talking about i've seen that it's again none of this is natural none of this is normal and it it's stuff that it's like problems that i don't you don't you shouldn't wish that you have these problems or just if you're a young person think like oh i'd be able to handle that or maybe it doesn't sound like a problem to you as a young person maybe you're one of the people who said you would sacrifice a like marriage and kids and a family member to be famous and this sounds great to you and you're like yes i can't wait ah. weird one like they they don't respond to criticism well they don't understand that they're still a human being in the middle of growth no they're a fucking star i'm a fucking star and i want this and i want it now yeah and they're just like what kind of fucking bullshit is this do we've, you know who i am yeah exactly we've seen we've <laughs> all seen that. we've all like, heard a version that. of that right and we the know problem. about it do you guys remember that video of Chank Unger from the Young Turks at the airport? I think it's one of the most shameful fame, drunk on fame videos I've ever seen. Um, what's incredible to me is that he thought this was going to be received well and make him look good. He's so full of himself, so narcissistic, so drunk on what he perceives to be fame. I don't even put him in the famous category, really. He's he you know yes within a certain ecosystem he is but not in the mainstream public he's not anyway he's at the airport and he just starts berating the airport staff for a delay that everyone is there having to deal with and he's berating them and he's just being nasty and he's filming it and he's doing this whole do you know who i am thing it's one of the most disgusting displays of self-importance that that i've seen in recent years the problem though is that they know that their shit stinks yes they know that they're human they right. know so they're so then they develop this sort of um fraud uh phobia right that people are going to find out what they really are mm -hmm. i mean i i've seen this with fashion models you know mm. I, I used to hang out with a lot of fashion models in Barcelona, you know that whole story where I lived in the mansion with the fashion models. Did you talk about that? Could be. I don't know. I'm not sure, but I'd love who to can hear keep it again. track of what the fuck we've talked <laughs> I about? No, it's impossible. Yeah, it's impossible. Um, yeah. Anyway, so uh, yeah, a fashion models they become fame, famous. wealth, yeah. people who are extremely sure. wealthy, and and that gets back to the seventy grand a year thing and mm -hmm. the whole sort of question of you know saturation you know what else it is it be, it becomes a real problem with things being too easy and life being like way too uh patterned like you you everything is very predictable in terms of like your success you have plenty of money you have uh, adulation from fans 
without any stress or duress. Like you can have a little bit of stress in terms of like trying to manage your career, but it's nothing like trying to make it. Yeah. That I don't know if I'm ever going to make it stress. That's a totally different kind of stress. I don't know if I'm ever going to be a success stress. That's real shit. That goes away once you yeah. definitely become Kanye West, or whoever the fuck you are. Right. And then you're subject to your own demons because right. then you're alone. You're yeah. really alone. You can't even go to the grocery store. You spend any time with Jim Carrey? No, I don't know him. I'd love Oh, just I'm going to pause it just for a couple things from the chat. Fallen friend. Hello, fallen friend. Says, hey, Carrie, I'm actually working hard to become an actor. The only reason why I'm pursuing it is because I feel called by God. It's tough with all this stuff in our culture. Um, well, good luck. And I'm glad you're I'm glad you're pursuing being an actor. And this is a good, your comment's a good springboard to talk about. You know, there's nothing wrong with aspiration. There's nothing wrong with seeing uh, something good and saying, I want that and I'm going to work towards that. There's nothing good with saying, I want to be successful in, you know, this project I'm doing or in the, my career or in my marriage or family. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and there's nothing wrong with going into the arts and entertaining people. I think, I think we need actually in the based world, you know, in the reality based world, the people who are who are not part of this mainstream woke religion. We need more artists. We need people making art and we need companies supporting these artists and helping, helping to create platforms. We need more movies. We need more actors. We need more music. We need more books and comic books and series. And, and, you know, we need more people uh, who are not, more artists who are not censored by this mainstream woke cabal, you know, out of fear of not being able to work again. We need more people like Gina Carano, who's suing Disney now. Go Gina. <laughs> um, so I wish you the best. It's not about it's not about going into art and it's not about wanting to be successful in art either. I guess. I guess I could share this anecdote from my husband. I'll just share a brief since I don't want to talk for him too much, but he's a musician. He's a very talented musician. And sometimes he gets people who come up to him at shows and they don't mean anything bad by it. They're trying to pay him a compliment, but they'll say things like, um, you should be famous. You should be, fa you should be, in Nashville, or you should be on The Voice, or you know, whatever. They're not trying to say anything bad, but it's funny because sometimes what is being said there is, um, it's sort of a, it's also what the I think the devil says to people. If you're a believer, if you're not a believer, you're going to be like, oh, she said the devil, I'm out. <laughs> but okay, if you're not a believer, it's that. Um, what some new age people call the the bad roommate in your head, like the critical voice. That's it's the ego. It's the, you should be, you should be, you deserve, you should be doing this. This thing is better. Being famous is better than what you're doing. And my husband's in a place now where he's like, but I really love what I do. I, you know, he, like any of us has his occasion. He still has battles with ego, but for the most part, he's radically different from how he was when he was young. And and he talks about, maybe sometime I can get on here to talk about pursuing fame. He's talked about it um, in interviews before. But that sort of chasing that instead of chasing the things that matter. Chasing fame instead of chasing, you know, the the feeling that he inspires in people with music, the feeling that he inspires himself, the joy of creating something. Um, it's something really different. He actually wrote a great piece. Maybe I'll link it below about when he was young and in New York and pursuing fame with his music and he, how he started working. He started doing, um, music therapy for Alzheimer's patients while he was in New York. And that ended up being the brightest part that ended up being the part of his New York experience where he actually learned something about music instead of about fame. And it's really beautiful piece. I'll, I'll find it and I'll put it in the description later. 
Um, but all this to say, you know, he wants, he still, he wants his music to be successful. Of course he does. Uh, I would love for his music to be successful. Of course I do, but not at the expense of things that are more important and not at the expense of getting priorities out of order where fame becomes the number one pursuit in and of itself. Do you know what I mean? He has a funny response now, not in a mean way, but like, <laughs> like we really love where we live in kind of the boonies in Texas. And um, we do a lot of gratitude prayers lately, but somebody told him at a show once, like one of these comments where they don't mean anything bad. They're just saying something that is, could be sound like what ego says sometimes and this person was like you you should move to nashville and he was like you should move to nashville <laughs> and i thought that's so funny because it's so out of it just turned things around in a comical way and the guy was like what why and he's like i don't know why do you want me to move there <laughs> he's like i don't want to live there do you want to live there no okay then why do you think i should go there <laughs> <laughs> you should you should move to Los Angeles. You should move to Los Angeles. <laughs> anyway, that just cra maybe that only makes me laugh, but it cracks me up. <laughs> I just I love sometimes I just love interactions with people in real life like just funny unexpected moments make me make me laugh a lot. Okay. We're going to watch just a little bit more of this Rogan clip, and then I want to play um, Russell Brand. Love to meet that guy. Yeah, he seems like he's in a weird stage of his life. He seems to me like someone who, <laughs> who you talked about, you know, you get to a, that, that pinnacle mm -hmm. and you have to deal with your demons. Yeah. It seems like he's dealt with them. I agree. And now he's come out the other side. Yeah. And he's in this very sort of this place of wisdom and uh and yeah it, it I, I just think he he's something russell brand is another guy who i i think i really admire wh where they are in their mm -hmm. lives and how they got there they sort of went through the fire and they've come out the other side somehow russell certainly has i know russell he's he's a sweetie he really is a super sweet guy like genuine yeah. too and yeah. really trying to like be a better person yes. and a better human and you know I don't agree with him on everything. He gets a little social gesture swarriery on some things, but I think it's just because he wants to do good and he's like leaning towards good and he's leaning towards love and he's like, it's, it's all for the right reasons. Like, Okay. That's, that's a great segue into the next one. Um, let me pull this next one up. Oh, thank you for the super chat. The John Beck for $10. Uh, he says, Carrie, I insult my husband to keep him humble. It's service. LOL. And yep, that Nashville story is funny. Uh, it is funny, right? Actually, don't insult him. I have, I know you're joking, but um, I have great respect for my husband. I don't like this trend that people have of like uh, this, th this cultural thing that people do sometimes where they make fun of their spouse in front of their spouse, like in front of other people, like it's a joke or even worse if their spouse isn't there. I don't like that. Um, that sort of, I, I don't think it's entirely innocuous even doing, you know, the old ball and chain saying stuff like that. I don't, I don't like that. Okay. Let's pull up the Russell brand clip. I do believe Russell brand is sincere. And I think he's on a path towards truth. And I think God is truth. And I think he's, it's becoming more evident possibly to him that that's the case because he's talking more about God. Did, is he one of the ones I haven't kept up? Is he one of the ones who recently converted? I think he did. But let's watch this. He's talking about fame. Fame is the mask that eats into the face of the wearer so said proust or virgil or <laughs> even merchant who is famous so he would know as a person now that's looking back on celebrity rather than in the tornado of it 
I can offer you, I hope, some insights on what the experience of being chewed up by the machinery of celebrity is like. What's thrilling and rewarding about it? What are the psychological impacts? Is it kind of a form of self-inflicted trauma? Is there any value to it at all? Let's reflect back on my own journey through the labyrinth of celebrity and see if there is anything that is universal that we can pluck from this personal experience. Next guest, he is one of the most exciting new names in stand-up comedy. This was a sort of a pivotal kind of TV appearance experience. This was in 2006. The reason I remember that is because West Ham got to the FA Cup final and I was like following West Ham a lot that season. And people at West Ham, Southern, where I'd gone my whole life, suddenly recognized me suddenly a place that was about crowds and anonymity and about the team but like the crowd turned around it's exhilarating and exciting and terrifying the first time that you're chased around by paparazzi the first time you hear camera lenses on the, a car window it's sort of like oh my god that thing when i was a little kid that i wanted to happen look it's actually happening it's somehow actually happening but there's something about it that is deeply unhealthy that you intuit it from the very beginning. Uh-oh, this ain't good. And you fracture. There is a fracture occurs. Like part of you, like you split. You know, you see it in a TV show sometimes when like a sort of a light body steps out of someone and looks back, like a phantom version of the self. And that thing goes off to live in the world of fame. You know, an object held in the culture that where people talk about you and discuss you and say things about you. And you think, what? Well, that's not even who I am. That's not what happened. That's not what I meant. That's not what I did. It's a contraption, a construction that's nothing to do with you. What I feel is, is that at this moment, I found, oh, wow, I can do this thing. I can remember being having a comic rapport with Jonathan. And then the attention after this was monumental. It was sort of, it was transformative. When you loomed around there, because you've got a very distinctive look about you, Russell, it was a bit, it was a bit like a dream. I don't reckon I loomed, I meandered. You meandered? There's a little bit of looming involved, if you don't mind me saying so. I deliberately timed that walk, Jonathan, so there'd be nothing startling about it. Talented actor and a comedian whose latest film is entitled Bedtime Stories. You can see that beginning Christmas Day. Even to look at David Letterman, who's about to introduce me onto the Letterman show, which was the apex of American talk show experience. You know, if you see uh, Letterman now, he's got a great big giant beard. He's on Netflix <laughs> in cowboy boots. He's clearly himself had an, a, an encounter, an experience of celebrity that has changed it. You see, anyone that's a performer, entertainer, creator in the public space likely has to a greater or lesser degree the twin motivations that I had, an earnest and sincere desire to create things, in my case, to make people laugh, to connect with people, along with this rather unstable requirement for attention and approval. The thing is that the latter can never be dealt with in this space. When you arrive there at that point on the path that you projected yourself towards, you find that there's nothing there. So if you are driven by an honest intention to convey sort of a message or to share a gift, that at least will sustain you. But the neurotic part of the drive, of course, can never be fulfilled. Here's Russell Brand. Russell. I had no idea at the time that what I'd done was constructed a persona or identity for myself. It wasn't really a conscious decision to make. I remember looking at sort of rock bands from the 70s and 80s and Noel Fielding, who I've always adored and still adore, and like thinking, I've got to look different. I can't look like, you know, so probably just a couple of years before that, I was hanging out with sort of like quite cool people in Camden. <laughs> wine house i don't consciously remember borrowing her haircut like and uh, god rest her soul you know i built a persona for myself a very identifiable figure i remember thinking i wanted to be recognizable in silhouettes i'd heard matt graining say about cartoon characters and like putting on the eye makeup and stuff and turning myself into a thing and when i look at this person that i created in a sense i'm quite glad that i did it because it means now that i don't do those things now that i don't live in that world now that i'm a father a husband and that the, my priorities in life are entirely different now that i'm no longer suspended in that stimulating state of fame now that i have come to earth i recognize oh my god there is peace here you know i have learned i have been shown that we in life tend to focus on the stimulant the external thing the person that annoys you or insults you the person that is attractive to you that appeals to you but what we should be focusing on is the stimulation 
what is happening to us, what is happening in the body. It's making me feel frightened. It's making me feel sad. It's making me feel angry. If you bring your attention to the internal rather than the external, to the feeling rather than the thoughts, you will receive the messages that some essential aspect of yourself, whether you believe in the scientific materialist perspective and it's your biology or a spiritual perspective and it's your consciousness more broadly, you can receive the message that you are being sent if you're not distracted by the rambling, rambling pirouettes of the ego. What is fame really? And Somebody in the chat says, uh, oh, where is it? His transformation is quite interesting. I'm, I can't find it now. I think it was Dion. Um, but yes, it has been. Yeah, there it is. His transformation is quite interesting. It has been. It has been. And I think, like I said, I think he's sincere and I'm very grateful for him because he talks about it so candidly and he has so much, he, he seems to have so much self-awareness about, about himself and humanity having gone through that, that whole ego fame gauntlet. Hello, force of light. Welcome. Good to see you. The John back for five dollars. Thank you for the super chat, sir. Says, do you think maybe Hollywood discourages family values so they can control their fame hungry employees better? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I don't know if it's consciously done, but everything in that world is is upside down. It's down is up, up is down. The things that are not, it, it's like um, the mainstream culture, but ramped up, you know, on speed. <laughs> That's what it was like in Hollywood because a lot of fame hungry people move there. Everyone is some somewhat like uh, they, like there's, there's desperation. I had a friend who used to work there when I when I lived there and worked there. He he's now moved to another country. He got out of that business entirely. But he described it as this sort of uh, hunger and desperation on people and this real extreme competitiveness and just surface level um, existence and nothing deeper. And a lot of people get pulled into all the vices we're familiar with, but again, kicked up to a hundred there. It's like, you know, alcohol and drug addiction and fame addiction and sexual perversion and all of it is just really rampant there. There's a lot of loneliness, I think, and just emptiness in that town. <clears throat> um, but yes. One other quick thing I wanted to say um, that he's making me think of when he's talking about the ego and fame and, and this world that he got thrust into and how unnatural it is and how he said, didn't you hear him say at the beginning, even when it was happening, part of you, part of him knew that it was not right, that there was something wrong with it. Um, one of the things my husband and I were talking about, he reads a lot of biographies of musicians that he admires. And, you know, I've talked about the Johnny, Ca Johnny Cash uh, biography. He's, he's currently reading one about Jimi Hendrix. And so he talks to me about some of the stuff that these musicians went through. And it's funny, you know, we as a society, myself, obviously included, tend to think of, um, tend to think of the fact that there's so many musicians, so many celebrities who die young of overdose. Um, you know, he just, Russell Brand just mentioned Amy Winehouse, for example. We tend to acknowledge that a lot of people who are um, that a lot of artists struggle with demons, depression, alcohol, et cetera. And we think that that is related somehow to their artistic genius and to um, their ability to create. And I've always thought of it that way because there's also, as we know, a lot of comedians. I worked in the comedy world. There's a lot of comedians like Robin Williams and Maria Bamford who struggle with depression. And the, the, that seems to be well known that that's something that uh, overlap sometimes. But one of the things I didn't start thinking about until recently is maybe the reason you see a lot of very creative, very talented musicians dying early, um, being destroyed, 
is not because genius and creativity necessarily has to come with those demons. Sometimes what, what portion of that is the fame? What portion of that is not being able to handle the fame and the ego and all the things that come with the ego and trying, trying to deaden the self, you know, all the, the addictions and stuff that come with it. If they, if they could be, a, you know, if Amy Winehouse didn't achieve the level of fame that she did, if she could create and have it touch people, but not come with all the, the, the stuff that it comes with, would she have fallen into the same addictions? Would she have had the same access to those addictions? That's the other thing is because then you've got, you know, they've got unlimited money and resources and yes men and enablers and, and so any demons you are struggling with get amped up because now there's nothing holding you back. You have access to it constantly. And you have people telling you, yeah, this is cool and enabling it like it's like you don't have a problem. And so all those talented artists who, you know, we talk about being taken early from us, like Chris Farley. All these comics and, and musicians and actors who've OD'd and stuff. It's like, yeah, part of that is bec maybe because you see creative people tend to have more demons. But maybe I think a big portion of it is the unnatural state that they're living in and not finding a way to ground themselves like Russell Brand seems to have done and to manage it. And to understand it and to step out of it and look back at it like the way he is and saying, you know, this was unnatural and unhealthy. Um, so in reading all of these music biographies, one of the things my husband shared with me about when he was younger and as I mentioned in New York and, and pursuing different things than he is now, always pursuing music, but different priorities there in terms of what was successful. Right. Um, in reading a lot of these biographies, he's like, you know, God saved me in a way because if that, if, if that had happened to me at that age, like I wouldn't have been able to handle it. You know, my husband and I are both sober four years, um, a little over four years. Praise God. <laughs> Knock on wood, all of that. Right. But back then, if that had happened and having that level of access to all of these vices and things. And, you know, he's like, it would have destroyed me. He's like, I don't even know if I would be here. And so weird the way the world looks at things. Like I mentioned, they'll say, you know, Oh, you should be this. Why aren't you famous yet? Why aren't you this yet? And it's like, maybe because God is protecting me. <laughs> maybe <laughs> it's a good thing. Do you know what I mean? Um, Okay, we'll continue with Russell. He's he's a lot. He packs a lot into these clips. So we had to take a little break. We'll go back. Millions of people you don't know having an opinion on you. What is it really other than an amplification of what all of us experience? Fear about what other people might be thinking about us. Gossip, what people are saying. It's really just a, a sort of a the social experience on steroids but here and there within it you find genuine experiences like it is amazing to be in a film with Helen Mirren or Alec Baldwin or Jonah Hill that you encounter brilliant people in a sense I'm in no position to judge the machinery of celebrity what I am in a position to judge is the way that the machinery of celebrity reacts with me and it was kind of almost like an allergy like I felt myself suspended in this state like those blue balls in the science museum not literal blue balls those glass spheres that have blue electricity in them you know and you put your hand on it it follows you around I felt like I was suspended in a state like that and it was such an obvious echo of addiction like being held up by opiates or being held up by libidinousness it's not something that you can sustain by this point beardless and with my mother at the Oscars this is when I <laughs> this is when I really started to recognize this thing ain't real and his date is his mother how proud I'll stop you there we're not dating there's literally laws against that <laughs> <laughs> I checked into it. I remember like a couple of times 
getting into altercations with paparazzi. <laughs> One time after I pushed one, my, my mate Matt said it was like uh, Liam Gallagher the musical. <laughs> 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 I was always getting in them kind of for cars. It's too much. Like when you live in Los Angeles and you're a famous person, it's all the time. It's like a grind. There's no downtime. There's no point where you're going to arrive at who you actually are. What are you actually? What is this really? Culture can be a beautiful thing, right? Van Gogh is culture. Uh, religion <laughs> is culture. But when culture is all about commodity and commodification, you find yourself suspended in this unreal formaldehyde, this unreal, it, it's intense experience, uh, unrelenting, unrelenting, and uh, very, 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 very challenging. Obviously, the what the experience has shown me is treasure and cherish the real discover what is sacred accept what happens to you and learn to see how it can be utilized for good the things in me that made me want to be famous in the first place they're sort of still there a kind of yearning but now having had a spiritual awakening as a result of the painful education i've received and i'm grateful to receive yes. when i find myself directly yes. yearning towards an external thing like oh perhaps some people would love me perhaps i could get some approval. <laughs> perhaps i could get some pleasure i sort of remember oh yeah that doesn't ever work yes ever. yes yes turn, the, turn this energy this craving this yearning this longing what does the wanting want to true connection and the only way to achieve this true connection is by adhering to certain principles living in accordance with certain laws that are so commonly found they may as well be referred to as universal compassion kindness service love surrender i absolutely love that i love what he's saying i i maybe that resonates with you in it resonates with me, the coming to, you know, in my case, coming to know God, you know, finding God happened on the back end of very painful life lessons, as he says, which is a very casual way to put something that's very painful. But um, yeah, I mean, thank God for him. That makes me that makes me so happy. So every, you know, for every Madonna who's not dealt with it well, who's still not dealing with it well, who still ha doesn't seem to have found what's important, like what he's talking about, the meaningful things, the things that actually are lasting, the things that actually mean something. For every one of her, I wish there were one of Russell Brand who comes out on the other side, who doesn't destroy himself, who actually finds goodness and truth and love on the other side of all that pain. Um, Robert Lowry, give it up for our mod, Robert Lowry, who says, Carrie, you're page two famous on Rumble Live. Woohoo, congrats. What does that mean? We are live streaming at Rumble. We are simulcasting there now. So uh, we just started doing that a couple of weeks ago. And if you would rather watch there because of YouTube censorious policies, I just got another email this morning saying they took a video down, an old one too. If you'd rather watch it rumble, you can do so there. And Robert, since you're over there, if there are any, um, I don't know what they even call them there. I haven't been there long enough to know. If there are any super chats there or, or good comments or questions, regardless, um, just would you mind posting them here and telling me they're from rumble? I can't unfortunately get them all to feed into StreamYard. So, uh, Hail Rumble, says Jacob. Yeah, Hail Rumble. Hi, John. Been listening on Rumble. Okay. I had some other articles and stuff about the dark side of fame. I don't know if it's worth watching. I have this old interview with on Oprah where she was interviewing the siblings of celebrities and she's got Madonna's sister on. Yeah, maybe we will we'll watch a little clip of this. I like watching old television clips. As you know, if you watch uh, our Wednesday night pop culture show, because Mr. Chris, Chris is always finding really great 
uh, clips from the 90s and 80s of news reports and talk shows and the old Oprah shows are crazy. I just watched, this is unrelated, but I just watched, um, if you're into two crime, you'll know who I'm talking about, the Be Betty Broderick. Remember that case? I forgot that Oprah had her on, even after she was convicted of murdering her ex-husband and his new wife. Oprah did a whole interview with her from while she was in prison and really sort of helped to paint her in this sympathetic light. It's crazy to watch that now and think, oh my goodness. I can't believe she, I can't believe she did that. Okay. This is, this is Madonna's sister. And she's talking, there's, she's here on a panel with other siblings of famous people and talking about some of the fallout of fame and what she's describing is, yeah, it's, it's the result of having someone in your family who becomes famous, which is an unnatural state of being, I think, and really hard for humans to deal with. And how does it affect, how does it affect your family? Have, have there ever been discussions about um, how the fame of your sisters uh, is affecting the rest of the family? Do you ever talk about it? Because it's not really a natural power because the power that they get outside of the family tends to come home with them. Okay. You know, so whenever they come home, there's always this barrier. You have to get through the barrier. Then you can start talking to them. And it, let's face it, when you get in a situation where you're being treated, you know, really well a lot, it's really hard to put it aside and just be a person. Yeah, to get in there and wash the dishes after Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> and it's also hard to talk to that person as a person if they're not willing, you know, to... Uh -huh. You know, when you when you think of your sister and what she means to you, there's something that strikes in your heart and you think, what? I have moments that I remember her and I really admire her for uh -huh. when we were growing up. And the, this one specifically sticks with me. We were riding our bikes on what was called Eagle Hill. Mm -hmm. And there was a path, a skinny little path like this. Mm -hmm. And it was me and her and all the guys, like all my brothers. And she rode her bike down it and mercilessly tumbled in a, in a patch and mm -hmm. just but she did it. I walked my bike down and she rode it down and I just was really, I admired that so much. I just thought it was great, even though she was totally tossed. Hi, YouTubers. I thought that was just a little, a touching little moment there at the end where she remembers her, like who she really is, you know? Uh, Davina had a great point in the chat. She said, I think some famous people don't like having people around who remind them of who they were and where they came from. I think that's definitely true. Okay. I've got another article uh, pulled up here. Let's see. We did the stunning statistics of young people <laughs> and what they would sacrifice to be famous. But I've also got this article. Let's see. This is from ABC News. This is from a couple years ago. And the headline is the dark side of fame and what it does to the brain. And we got a picture of Ben Lee here, the musician. I'm just going to read a little bit of this because they have different famous people in here describing how it affected their head, like the sort of the way that Russell Brand is describing. Um, have you ever dreamed of being famous? It says, even if we're a bit embarrassed to admit it, fame seems to offer some huge benefits, wealth, access, validation, adoration, but being a celebrity can come at a huge cost. Yeah. That's the thing is at what cost? <laughs> and the experience can be both isolating and addictive just ask 2007 Australian Idol winner Natalie Gauchi. She says, quote, you can get into this headspace where everything feels like a fantasy and then nothing is reality anymore. And that's where things get dangerous. This part here reminds me of what Russell Brand was saying about how the first time he it hit him what fame was that he was now famous or entering, you know, into something new that felt a little wrong. And he described it as sort of an out of body experience where he split apart and there's his real self. And there's this part of himself that is the famous part that is sort of like um, a character that he wears almost. 
so she's talking about winning one of these reality shows. What did she say? Was it American Idol? I'm not sure. Australian Idol. Okay. Quote, it was just all systems go. There was no time to think. There was no time to really celebrate, she says. This is after she won. Um, but it was when the heat from Idol started to die down that she began to struggle. I was recording my second album and I went to America and I just turned into a different person and I just sabotaged my next opportunity. Just before the, the release of her second album, Gauchi walked away from her record deal and left Australia. That may have been a very smart thing to do at the time, though. That may have been the best thing to happen to her at that point. There's another... Here, this part. I want to read about um, the addiction part. Fame becomes an addiction. We become addicted to that level of not only attention, but adulation. There's also this has-been problem because you can't keep that bright light forever. And in fact, this quote here reminds me of some things that I mentioned Madonna earlier, something that Madonna said in an interview that my pastor, again, um, my, my pastor is Bradley Helgerson at Church on the Square. If you're interested in checking out his sermons, he's always saying things that stick in my head. And one of the things he said about Madonna, this was a few years ago, he was he read a quote of hers from an interview and I'm just going to paraphrase it. I don't have it in front of me, but she essentially was saying that she's saying what the, what this said right here, that you can't keep that bright light forever. Cause it, the fame thing is, is not uh, satisfying. Um, it's a, it's like a cheap substitution for something that actually is fulfilling and meaningful. And what Madonna was saying to paraphrase was that, that no level of success is ever enough that she said, as soon as I accomplish something or succeed at something that she, she said she feels like somebody for just a little bit because of that, uh, you know, adoration, that validation, that success, that next bit of fame, whatever it is, she feels like somebody for a little bit and then it goes away and she feels like nothing. This is one of the most successful, famous, wealthy celebrities, you know, artists in, in the West. And she said, she feels like nobody after each of those. And then she has to attain the next level and the next level and get the next thing so that she feels like somebody for just a little bit. And that's such a sad, that's such a sad insight into herself. And that was from an interview years ago. And so that's why at the beginning, when I, used her as the illustration of, you know, there, but for the grace of God go, we, it's so sad to look at where she is now and see that apparently she's still struggling with that same thing. And this isn't to bash on her. A lot of us take a while to learn the lessons that, well, you know, the universe is teaching us. That's, that's something that, um, people who are not Christians will say the universe, but I think you're talking about the same thing as me. When I say God, the lessons that God's trying to teach us, I had to learn the same lessons many, many times. And sometimes I'll think, Oh, I've got that lesson. I've learned it. And then something will come up and I'll realize, no, I haven't entirely learned it yet again. I have to learn the same thing. And for her, her seems to be that it seems to be, for Madonna, like, how old is she now? She's in her 60s and she still hasn't figured out what's in, what's meaningful and what's important, what to try and keep at the top against all odds, against all the odds stacked against her because of her incredible fame, wealth, you know, power, influence, access to things. All of those odds stacked against her. How does she keep what's important at the top? I think she needs to be listening to people like Russell Brand <laughs> who've been through that and come out the other side of it. But she's still chasing this. I I, I think for her, fame is also wrapped up in not just worship, worship of her from all these, you know, the whole population, strangers, what have you. I think it's also for her specifically wrapped up in her sex appeal. 
And so that's why you've got this woman in her 60s who's gone through all more plastic surgery than I've seen on anyone and constantly posting these very um, um, desperate sort of sex sexy selfies and with lots of filters and just this sort of uh what what do the kids call them thirst traps <laughs> where she just wants people to be in the comments strangers uh, yes it's so sexy it's not it's sad if only she had someone in her circle who could say this is sad you need help Okay, let me add this back to the screen for a second. So we're talking about the addiction part. Look at this. Dr. Rockwell's study identifies four phases of fame. The first phase is love-hate. They love finally getting acknowledged, but then it gets creepy and they hate it. Then there's an addiction phase. I may not like this, but for some reason, I can't live without it. The third phase is acceptance, and the fourth and final stage is adaptation, which includes realizing you're part of something larger than yourself. I don't know how many of them make it to that. Um, so then they have Ben Lee, who uh, says Ben Lee had his first taste of fame at just 13 when he got a record deal with his band, Noise Addict, quote, when you're famous or experiencing some fame, it does feel like you're at the center of the world, he says. And all the various problems or issues kind of revolve around you. So this is not normal for humans to feel this way. And it's a lie. It's not true. It, 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 it messes up your brain to feel that way. To feel that you're at the center of the world. Everything revolves around you. It's not, it's not, it's not healthy for you. Um, anyone who has any involvement in show business or has any taste of celebrity understands that there's a really sweet spot on this continuum. That's where you have access to what you want access to, but people are not bothering you. I mean, that's the dream. <laughs> that's what he says. If you could just pause it at a certain place on that continuum, I guess. I've got a couple before we close out. Um, let me see. I don't think we're gonna. I don't think I'm gonna read that article. I am gonna read this one. So, I'm a believer, as you know. If you if you watch the show regularly, I'm a pretty new believer. Um, you know, I started finding my way to God or back to God, I guess you could say, and around 2017. And I'm the last person who ever thought I would be a Christian. I had all these stereotypes and prejudices about Christians. And, and I get it. If you're like, I'm going to tune out now because now she's going to talk about God. That's fine. But I can't not talk about him because, you know, I had someone on, on Twitter say to me yesterday or the day before, I can't remember. It was sort of like a, there was a post I did that was, that was for fellow believers. It was, it, I was talking to them about something from, it, if you don't share this belief system, then I wouldn't imagine that you're interested. Maybe you are, and that's cool, but um, I don't expect you to agree because we don't even share the foundation of belief. So why would you agree about this thing that's, that's meant for Christians on the best way for Christians to look at a certain thing, right? So this person was sort of um, like, why do you have to talk about God or, you know, I, and I get that once in a while and, and I don't understand that because if it's not for you, then it's not for you. We all on, on social media or, uh, in our daily life, or if we're, if you write, um, you have different people that you address. You don't always address the same people. Sometimes I share things that are anybody can enjoy, um, things that I'm thinking about and you don't have to share my belief system. Um, other times I share things that are specifically for people in my old ideology, for people in the social justice or woke cult. I'm saying, hey, what do you think about this? Or have you seen this? Or have you noticed this? Like, um, It's specifically for those people. Um, sometimes I share things that are specifically for 
anyone that's in this, what I call the reality based movement, you know, no matter your belief system, if you're a Christian or not, or um, if you're a Democrat or Republican, or it doesn't matter as long as you're in this reality based movement, you know, as long as you're based, right? Like that's who I'm talking to. And other times, yes, I will talk specifically to Christians. Like, why wouldn't I? I also share things sometimes that are just meant for people who like my weird dog. <laughs> and if it's not for you, then it's not for you. Scroll on by. I'm not talking to you. I always find that really odd. Anyway, sorry, that's a, I got sidetracked because yes, I'm about to say something that's based in how I view the world. I, I do view, I believe God heals all things. I believe that because God was like the last thing, the last thing in the world that I would open my mind to or consider. And it turned out to be the one thing, the one thing that, that gave me meaning, that gave me purpose. The one thing that was, was bigger than me. That's not, um, you know, based in my head in my own, uh, rules uh, that I cobbled together on how to live and, or based on an, uh, an evil belief system like social justice and their upside down, crazy, racist, sexist rules on how to live. You know, it's sort of like what Russell Brand was saying <clears throat> when I started reading the Bible, I was looking at it like, whoa, like all these things are common sense. They should be. It's just not that it's, it, it's that it's common sense isn't common anymore. And so this is from a Christian perspective, of course, but it, there's this article, it's called um, C.S. Lewis on how to be yourself. <clears throat> and I'm just going to read some of the selected quotes in this piece, because I thought they were really great. Um, and they have to do with this topic about ego, about fame, right? Identity, all of that stuff. So here's one of his quotes. He says, the more we let God take us over, the more truly ourselves we become because he made us, he invented us. He invented all the different people that you and I were intended to be. It's when I turn to Christ, when I give up myself to his personality that I first begin to have a real personality of my own. This is one of those things that as a, as a pretty new Christian is amazing to me that it, one of these sort of, um, uh, epiphanies and and it's probably if you're if you've been a Christian for a long time you're like oh yeah duh but imagine the first time you hear about the death of self right like hearing about that stuff and hearing about um, you don't find yourself until you let your ego die until you until you have that death of self of of that whole mask or whatever that you've created this sort of like Russell Brand was saying that part of him that was out in the world being famous. Right. <laughs> um, it's, it's just, it's, it's an amazing trick the way that that works. I mean, it's not a trick, but it's just, I, I think this is so true. It's not until you kill or work on killing all of those ego desires, those things based in the flesh those things that are about self-aggrandizement. It's not until you you pray about having those things removed from you that you start to really find out who you are. Like when I was in the social justice world, I don't, I don't know. I wasn't in touch with who I was. I didn't have God and who I was. I find so many people do this. <clears throat> this is a human thing <clears throat> is we build our identity around all these things that are not really us. Like you build your identity around, well, in the social justice world tells you build your identity around your race and your sex and your sexuality and your size and your mental health status. And, you know, all the different categories of oppressor, oppressor or oppressed. It tells you your identity is all these things. Oh, it's your immutable characteristics. And it's what, which of these groups you're in. That's not your identity. But you will see so many people in that world, <clears throat> a big portion of their identity is based on those things. Excuse me one second. <clears throat> and that's why they have in their bios, 
when they tell you who they are in their short little bio on Twitter or social media, it'll say, you know, black woman, trans, queer, disabled, uh, you know, depression. They start listing their, their mental health issues because that means they get to claim more, you know, oppressed group status. And they'll say, like, they'll even put personality disorders in there, BPD, fat, you know, all these different things. None of that is who you are. None of that tells me anything about you except what your belief system is, I guess, since you think those things are your identity and those things are important. It tells me about your beliefs. It tells me about what you believe. It doesn't tell me who you are. And so in my old life, I think my identity was cobbled together with these things that so many humans that we, that we, we cobble our identity together with those things, the immutable characteristics, and then also with our successes or failures. I also see people do that, like try and define themselves by what they've achieved or haven't achieved. Like, this is who I am. I knew someone who was seriously like, you've all heard the, um, we've all heard the cliche of the, the person who never like leaves hi high school in terms of who they are and their mentality. They're always like, they, it never gets better than that, I guess. Or they're always talking about that winning touchdown they scored or something 30, 40 years ago. And that's how, how they see themselves. I knew someone like that who had a, a bit part in a TV show in the eighties and seriously was like, that's who I, that's who I am. Here, let me show you this VHS tape of this time I was on a show. <laughs> like, that was like, wait, what is this? This isn't who you are. And I did that too. I had a, you know, part of my identity was built around the whole ego thing of how the world measures success and status and prestige. And, you know, oh, I'm a producer on a television show. I've got, you know, I'm successful all of that crap. And it, and it is crap. It was crap. I'm grateful for it. I learned a lot, a lot. I'm grateful for all of it. Even the mistakes I made, I've learned to be grateful for them, but none of that means anything. It's not your identity. <laughs> I also, I, I mentioned this in one of my sub stacks recently. I hate the word activist. Some people put that, take that on as their identity. I'm an activist. I don't care if you say what kind of activist you are. If you're like, I'm an anti-woke activist. There's something that word that just bothers me. That tells me what you think of yourself. <laughs> maybe, maybe this is just me. Maybe Maybe I haven't fully discovered where this pet peeve is, but sometimes people call me an activist and I can't stand it. I'm like, no, I'm not, I'm just a lady who says what I think. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, a, I have allegiance to Christ. Yes, I have. So my identity is in God. My identity is in you know, being a wife, I have allegiance to my husband, but beyond that, I don't know. People call me all different kinds of things. The danger is if you let those things go to your head, whether they're positive or negative, and you start to like, think that's, that's who I am. That summary of something I did or something that happened to me, good or bad, when it's, good right as the world judges it good then that's when you have this danger with like ego i think and chasing more of that so anyway we'll continue this is another quote from c.s lewis individuality is only possible if it unfolds from wholeness ego centeredness is not individuality at all ego centeredness is centered on the self-image which is an illusion and a delusion Therefore, it's nothing at all. True individuality means you have a true being which unfolds from the whole in its particular way for that, for that particular moment. <clears throat> and then this is the last one I'm going to read. Um, 
again from C.S. Lewis, the very first step is to try to forget about the self altogether. Your real new self, which is Christ's and also yours and yours just because it is his, will not come as long as you are looking for it. It will come when you are looking for him. I realize to non-believers, this, all of this sounds like mumbo jumbo. Probably sometimes I try to put myself in my old, like, think about who I was before and how I'd read that quote, and it would probably sound just like word salad to me back then. So that's okay. I understand if it's like, ah, that doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> I think it means a lot, though. Now looking at that, I think it means a lot taking the focus off of the self, like the self image. And imagine how incredible that is to destroy the ego, to destroy the self image. If, if you're, if you, if you're famous, if that self, false self image that you've built up, that identity, whatever, is not just propped up by you, but by the world. You know, look at all the people that prop up Madonna's craziness on Instagram. All those enablers are like, yeah, you go, queen. This is sexy, you know, da -da -da, on their phones. Ah, uh, like, how would you get out of that? I don't know. So that is why I thank God <laughs> that I am not famous. And I think you should thank God for that, too. And, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, if you think I presented a skewed, a skewed uh, version of what fame is, let me know. I'm not saying there are no positives that come with it. Of course there are. Otherwise society wouldn't hold it up as this thing that people should strive towards. There are definitely positives. It's just, wow, do we tend to culturally ignore how destructive it can be. So listen up, young people. <laughs> listen up, young people. There are higher things to aspire to than fame. Okay. <clears throat> well, here's one that's funny. Ha ha ha. No divine being of love would ever say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Well, he did, and he is. So I don't I don't even know what that means. I don't know if you're trying to I don't know why you think that, I guess. I don't know what I don't know where that thought comes from. Uh Okay. Any questions? All ears. I'm going to be on Toxic Femme tonight on Midnight's Edge. That's at 7 o'clock Central. We've missed a couple of those. And it's going to be nice to see those ladies. So if you are a fan of the show or if you've never seen it before, come and hang out. There's going to be a big panel of, of ladies and Tom over at uh, Toxic Femme Midnight's Edge. And I'm going to try and take a nap before then because, man, I have not been able to sleep the past two nights. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. I hope you guys have a great rest of your Monday. I forgot to do announcements at the top. I'll do them now. We are doing... Uh, book club on Thursday, March 7th, Deprogram Book Club. We're reading Critical Dilemma by Neil Shinvey and Pat Sawyer. Here's a copy of the book. You have time to read it. I'm also going to be interviewing Neil and Pat and releasing that around the same time. And if you have questions for them and you've started reading the book, feel free to leave those questions in the comments below. I'll probably ask that on each video going forward. So if you have specific questions about the book, or things you think I should ask them, let me know. But we are going to be doing a group discussion on Thursday, March 7th. If you are in the Austin, Texas area, or if you like to travel for events, MindsFest is coming back to Austin. This is going to be April. What is it? Saturday. Saturday, April 27th at the Vulcan. I'm going to be moderating some panels. Shane Cashman's hosting. There's a whole lineup of panelists and comedians, including uh, Jimmy Dore, Lauren Chen, Sean Fitzgerald, who's actual justice warrior, Alex Stein, um, Ian Cash, Cash. Oh no. Ian Crossland. Sorry. Luke Radowski. A lot of the Tim cast people are going to be there. Um, 
you can get tickets online, go to minds.com, look up Minds Fest 2024. And we are probably going to be having a deprogram meetup that weekend. I will let you know more closer to the date. And if you're one of the people who's already emailed me about information for the meetups, thank you. I got back to everyone this morning, I believe. If I didn't get back to you, let me know. Um, and a house concert. My husband and I, the next, the first house concert of 2024 is going to be on March 29th, which is a Friday. And if you would like the ticket link, we still have not sent it out yet. So you haven't missed anything. We're going to be blasting that out soon with information about the show. We do limited tickets because it's in our home. And I, we don't put the link public because it's in our home. So if you want to get the email with the link, send me a note at deprogrammedpod at gmail.com and just let me know who you are in the chat or uh, so that I know who you are. And in the subject, put, you know, house concert list and we'll add you to that list. So you, you find out when we do those. Um, I think that's it. I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. And uh, if you're going over to Toxic Film tonight, I will see you there. Thanks guys. Bye.